Welcome back, everyone, to the EFI Hardware Podcast. I'm your AI host, uh, and of course, with me is our resident expert. And fellow AI voice, bringing you the latest in tuning knowledge, all human approved, of course. You know, that's right. Today, we're diving into a mod that always gets a lot of attention, ITB throttle bodies. Ah, yes. ITBs, they got that undeniable appeal, you know, that mechanical symphony of individual throttle bodies, but... Uh, the setup can be a bit tricky if you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely, and it seems like a lot of people try to approach tuning ITVs with the same mindset as a single throttle body setup, mm. you know, relying on manifold absolute pressure or MAP. Right, and that's where things get interesting, you see, with a single throttle body and a plenum. That plenum volume is key. It's like a reservoir smoothing out all those pressure pulses from the cylinders as they suck in air so the MAT sensor gets a nice steady reading of the overall pressure. So the ECU basically knows how much air the engine's breathing in. Exactly. It's like a nice clear picture. But uh, with ITBs, each cylinder has its own throttle body, its own direct path to the intake port, no plenum to calm things down. Makes sense. But wait a second. I remember some factory turbocharged engines used ITVs, like the Nissan RB26 and SR20 DET. They used MAFs, right? Why not just use those for aftermarket setups? That's a good point. MAFs do directly measure the airflow, but in the aftermarket world, they can be a little finicky, you know, sensitive to dirt and changes to the intake. Plus, they have limitations in how much airflow they can actually measure. Ah. Now I gotta get into the nitty gritty of the mechanical setup. And that starts with something super important for drivability throttle plate synchronization. I've heard this can be a real headache. Why is it so crucial? Well, the way air flows through a throttle body isn't perfectly linear. You know, at small throttle openings, even tiny little differences in how far the throttle plates are open can lead to big differences in airflow between cylinders. So one cylinder could be sucking in a ton of air while another one's barely getting a sip. Exactly, and that can create some serious imbalance. You could have one cylinder running lean while others are rich, even if the overall air-fuel ratio looks okay. That's not good. So how do we avoid that? That's where a good carb balancer comes in. It's a simple tool, but essential for ITB setups. It lets you measure the airflow at each cylinder and fine tune those throttle plates until they're all pulling their weight. Like fine tuning an orchestra to get that perfect harmony. All right, so we've got our throttle plates synced up. Are we done with the mechanical stuff? Not quite. Remember that MAP sensor we seemingly abandoned? Well, it still has a role to play, even in an Alpha N world. Wait, I thought we were moving away from MAP-based tuning? Where are yeah. we bringing it back? Because most ECUs use that MAP signal for background fuel compensation, air density changes with pressure, so the ECU needs to know what the ambient pressure is to really dial in the fueling. Okay, so the MAP sensor is like a fine-tuning knob ensuring the fueling is spot on, even with changes in air pressure. Precisely, and it's particularly important for ITBs because we don't have that plenum volume to smooth out pressure variations. Yeah. You know, imagine driving uphill air density drops, the ECU needs to adjust fueling, and that's where the MAP sensor comes in. I see. So MAP still has its place even with alpha N, but how do we get a reliable MAP reading with all those individual throttle bodies? That's where the MAP sensor collector connects to each throttle body and basically creates a central point where we can tap into the average manifold pressure. That average signal then feeds to the MAP sensor, giving the ECU a much better understanding of what's happening in the intake manifold. Okay, so it's like getting a consensus from a team instead of just listening to one person makes sense now with our fuel strategy and MAP situation figured out. What about idle speed control with these ITBs? Ah, uh, yes, idle speed control. That's another area where ITVs can throw a wrench into the works with a single throttle body. You can usually just use an air bypass system to control the idle. You mean like a controlled leak that lets enough air pass the throttle plate to keep the engine humming along? Right, and because of that plenum volume, the ECU can see the change in MAP and uh, adjust fueling as that bypass air is added. But with ITVs, things get a bit more complicated, you know? Yeah, if you just bypass air into one throttle body, that cylinder is going to run lean while the others stay the same. Not exactly ideal. Not at all. So if you're going to use an air bypass system with ITDs, you ideally want another balance bar to distribute that bypass air evenly to all the cylinders. Okay, so doable, but not the most elegant solution. Is there a better way? The cleanest way, in my opinion, is to ditch the bypass system altogether and go with drive-by-wire throttle actuation. You know, with drive-by-wire, the ECU has direct control over the throttle plates themselves, so you get precise idle speed control without all that bypass complexity. That makes a lot of sense. Huh. Drive-by-wire definitely simplifies things. But what about people with mechanical throttle setups? Are they stuck with the balancing act? Not necessarily. Some people use ignition control to manipulate idle speed by retarding the timing slightly. 
you can effectively lower the idle, but you can only adjust it so much before you start running into problems. Yeah, I can imagine retarding the timing too much could lead to all sorts of issues like heat buildup. Exactly. So while it can be a helpful tool, it's not a complete solution. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here from understanding why traditional MAP-based tuning isn't ideal for ITBs to the importance of throttle plate synchronization and the different approaches to idle speed control. We have, and it's clear that setting up ITBs requires a different way of thinking and a lot of attention to detail. Well, before we move on, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned earlier, those awesome sounds that ITBs make. Oh yeah, the sound is amazing. It's like music to a car enthusiast's ears, right. but I know there's more to it than just sound. What about actual performance gains? You're right. The sound is a big part of the appeal, but you definitely get performance benefits too, especially for naturally aspirated engines. One of the biggest is improved throttle response. Ah, so because each cylinder has its own throttle plate, the engine is super sensitive to any input from the gas pedal. Exactly. It's like a direct connection between your foot and the combustion process. And that responsiveness translates to real world performance, you know, especially on the track or when you're really pushing the car. Okay, so throttle response is a big plus. What else do ITBs bring to the table? Well, remember how we were talking about tuning and how individual throttle bodies make MAP-based tuning less reliable? Well, that same individual control gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to optimizing the intake system. Specifically, we can really fine-tune the intake length for each cylinder. Right. With a single throttle body, you're kind of stuck with whatever runner length the manifold has. But with ITBs, we have more options. Exactly. And that brings us to trumpet length. By carefully choosing the length of those trumpets, we can create what's called a ram effect, basically boosting volumetric efficiency at specific RPM ranges. Okay, hold on. Break that down for me. What exactly is volumetric efficiency and how does trumpet length play a role? So think of volumetric efficiency as how well the engine fills its cylinders with air. The more air we can pack in, the more fuel we can burn and the more power we can make. Are the basics of internal combustion. Exactly. Now the length of those trumpets affects how air flows into the cylinders. It's all about physics and something called resonance. By choosing the right length, we can create a pressure wave that basically force feeds the intake charge. It's like a mini turbocharger powered by sound waves. Wow, that's a cool way to think about it. But if I remember correctly, doesn't this boost usually come at a cost, like a trade-off at other RPMs? You got it. Boosting performance in one RPM range often means sacrificing some performance elsewhere. Uh, there's no magic trumpet length that's perfect for every situation. So finding the ideal trumpet lengths for your specific engine and how you use it takes some experimentation. We've got our throttle plate synced. We're using Alpha N with an MAP sensor for fine tuning. We've tackled idle speed control and we've dialed in our trumpet lengths. Anything else we need to consider on our ITB journey? Well, we focus a lot on the mechanical stuff, but now let's talk about something that often gets overlooked, injector positioning. Right, where those fuel injectors are located can actually make a difference, can't it? Absolutely. Most manufacturers put the injectors close to the intake valve, which is fine for stock engines, but for performance builds, especially with ITBs, there can be benefits to moving them further away from the valves, even outside the trumpets. That seems counterintuitive. Why would we want to move the injectors further from where the fuel needs to go? It's all about giving the fuel more time to mix with the air, creating a more homogeneous mixture before it enters the combustion chamber. So a well-mixed air fuel charge means more efficient combustion makes sense. Exactly. And there's another advantage to moving the injectors further upstream. When fuel evaporates, it absorbs heat. So injecting further away from the valves can actually cool down the intake charge, which can slightly improve volumetric efficiency. Wow. So we're getting a double benefit, better mixing, and a cooler intake charge. Yeah. I'm starting to see how... Even these small details can have a big impact with ITBs. They do. And speaking of details, imagine if you had two sets of injectors, one set close to the valve for low load conditions and another set further out for high RPM, wide open throttle. That's next level stuff. It's like having a dedicated fuel system for each driving mode. Now that sounds pretty cool, dual injectors for ultimate control. But let's get back to reality for a second. We've been talking a lot about naturally aspirated engines. Are ITBs even a good fit for boosted applications? That's a great question, and one we get a lot. While we typically see ITBs on naturally aspirated engines, they can definitely be used with forced induction, although it's less common. Why is that? Is it just a matter of complexity, or are there other reasons? It's partly complexity, but it's also a question of whether the benefits of ITBs outweigh the challenges in a boosted setup with a turbocharger or supercharger already forcing air into the engine. 
Those gains in throttle response and top-end power from ITBs might not be as noticeable. So it's like trying to add sprinkles to a cake that's already covered in frosting might be overkill. That's a good way to put it. But there are some examples of manufacturers using ITBs on turbocharged engines like those Nissan RB26 and SR20 DET engines we talked about earlier. They were going for even sharper throttle response, even with the turbo in the mix. Interesting. So it seems like ITBs on a boosted engine could have benefits, but it's not as straightforward as with naturally aspirated applications. Right. It really comes down to your goals and how much effort you're willing to put in. Now let's switch gears a bit and address some common questions we get about ITBs. One we hear a lot is, can you run individual O2 sensors in each exhaust runner for better data logging and tuning? That seems like it would be helpful, especially with how important it is to get each cylinder running smoothly with ITBs. It definitely can be, particularly during the initial tuning stages. Having those individual Lambda sensors lets you see exactly what's going on in each cylinder. You can catch any lean or rich conditions that might be hidden if you're just using a single wideband sensor in the collector. So it's like a health checkup for each cylinder, making sure everyone's performing at their best. Exactly. This level of detail can help you pinpoint any imbalances and fine tune the fuel map for each cylinder. But once you've got the overall fuel map dialed in and those throttle plates perfectly synced, the need for individual Lambda monitoring goes down. Now, another question that comes up a lot is, why don't more aftermarket setups use MAFs instead of messing around with Alpha N and MAP sensors? Yeah, I was wondering about that too. MAFs seem like they would make things simpler, at least in theory. I mean, they directly measure airflow. Right, and some manufacturers like Nissan did use MAFs with ITBs, but MAFs have some downsides that make them less desirable in the aftermarket. For one, they can be sensitive to dirt over time and that affects their accuracy. Okay, so practicality and sensitivity issues make MAFs less appealing for aftermarket ITB setups. Okay, that clears things up. Now, before we move on, I wanted to bring up a question from a listener who's running a six-cylinder engine with ITBs and a throttle cable. They asked if it's normal for the pedal to feel heavy with that setup. That's a good question. It really depends on the specific throttle body setup and the return springs they're using. It shouldn't feel super heavy, but if it feels way too heavy, it could be a sign of a problem like binding throttle plates or return springs that are too strong. So it's worth checking out if something feels off. Now, another listener asked about the ideal distance between the throttle blades and the intake ports. Does it matter, assuming the overall runner length is the same? That's getting into some really specific details. There are definitely some effects related to throttle blade proximity to the intake port, but it's a complex topic, and the impacts are subtle and hard to measure without extensive testing. And with most aftermarket ITB setups, you're limited to whatever configuration the manufacturer offers, unless you want to start fabricating custom parts. Right. At wide open throttle, the distance between the throttle blade and the intake port becomes less important because there's very little restriction to airflow. So it's one of those areas where the theoretical benefits might not be worth a hassle now while we're talking about specific setups. Someone pointed out that the Toyota 40 GE silver top engine used a MAF sensor while the black top variant switched to a MAP sensor. Any idea why they made that change? It's a good example of how even car manufacturers have tried different ways to manage ITBs. The silver top aimed for simplicity with MAF, while the black top went for the flexibility and packaging advantages of the MAP sensor. Interesting. It seems like there's no one right answer. It all depends on the engine and what you're trying to achieve. Mm. Okay, before we wrap up this part of our ITB discussion, I want to address one final question that sparks some debate. Yeah. Can you share the idle air with the MAP balance bar instead of using a separate one? Ah, that's an interesting idea. Instead of having two separate balance bars for the MAP sensor and the idle air bypass, we're combining them into one. Some manufacturers have actually done this, like on those Toyota 4AG E20 valve throttle bodies you mentioned. So it can be done, but are there any downsides to this approach? The main concern is that the pulsing of the idle air control solenoid can create fluctuations in the MAP signal. So it's like trying to have a conversation next to a jackhammer. The noise makes it hard to hear what the other person is saying. Exactly. While sharing the idle air with the MAP balance bar can work, it's generally better to keep them separate for a clean, stable MAP signal, which is what we do with our EFI hardware balance bars. This ensures the most accurate fueling possible. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to address something that always comes up when we talk about ITBs. Are they really worth all the effort and complexity, or are they just a fancy, expensive way to make your engine sound cool? Ugh. 
the age-old question function versus form, it's something everyone considering ITBs has to think about. Right, on the one hand, we've seen how ITBs can give you real performance benefits, especially for naturally aspirated engines. You know, improved throttle response, mm -hmm. the potential for more power and greater control over how you tune the intake system. So for those who really want to squeeze every bit of performance out of their engine, those gains can be significant. Absolutely, but there's no denying that setting up ITBs the right way is more complicated. It requires a deeper understanding of how everything works, a lot of attention to detail, and a willingness to experiment and fine tune. It's not just a simple bolt-on mod. There's a certain level of commitment involved that might not be for everyone. You got it. If someone's looking for a quick and easy way to gain horsepower, ITBs might not be the best choice, but for those who really love building engines, who enjoy the challenge of optimizing every little thing, and who want that raw connection between the driver and the machine, ITBs can be incredibly rewarding. The ITDs bring a certain rawness to driving. You feel every little thing the engine does, every change in airflow. It's a level of engagement that's hard to find anywhere else. So for our listeners who might be on the fence about ITBs, mm -hmm. I think it comes down to this. If you're willing to put in the time and effort to do it right, the rewards are definitely there. I think that about covers it. For this episode of the EFI Hardware Podcast, we've explored ITB throttle bodies from top to bottom, debunked some myths, and shared some exciting news from EFI Hardware. We hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. It's been great talking with you all, and as always, we encourage you to reach out to us on the EFI Hardware forums or social media if you have any questions or just want to chat about ITBs. Until next time, happy tuning, everyone. <laughs>